Welcome, everyone. I'm Sharon Hoffman, a Ranch National Council member and a past trustee at the ranch. And this is my husband, John. It is, oh my God, we're a little flustered this morning. So uh, it is our pleasure to welcome you to, to today's summer series conversation with Nick Cave, whom we are fortunate to have known for actually over 35 years. Uh, it's pretty special. We would also like to give a special welcome to Bob Faust, Nick's partner, collaborator, and special projects director who is with us here today, right here. <laughs> Tomorrow night at the ranch's recognition dinner, Nick Cave will receive the Anderson Ranch International Artist Award. We are pleased to have this opportunity today to learn more about him by listening in on a conversation between him and the ranch's renowned curator and residence, Helen Molesworth. <laughs> Nick Cave is an artist, educator, and foremost, a messenger, working between the visual and performing arts through a wide range of mediums, including sculpture, installation, video, sound, performance, and fashion. Uh, <laughs> He is well known for his sound suits, which camouflage the body, masking and creating a second skin that conceals race, gender, and class, forcing the viewer to look without judgment. Nick's solo exhibitions are extensive and have toured globally from the United States through France, Africa, Denmark, Asia, South America, and the Caribbean. He has been represented by Jack Shaneman Gallery since 2006 and is professor and chairman of the fashion department at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Sharon and I first uh, <clears throat> came in contact with Nick as uh, a graduating senior from the Kansas City Art Institute. And we were called to come to a fashion show. This was 1982. And uh, we came and we were blown away by this fashion show and the artist was Nick. His, his uh, advisor and head of the department said it was the, he was the best student to ever go through the Art Institute. 24 years later, in 2006, we bought our first piece of art uh, at the Jack Sheeman Gallery. It was entitled, The Day After Yesterday. And it is a white sequin and black hair work, seven panels, 14 feet high, and it's the centerpiece of our collection today. Today, while not surprised, we are proud that Nick has matured into the internationally renowned uh, artist that he is. An individual who truly demonstrates the highest level of artistic achievement and whose career has fundamentally influenced contemporary art. Before turning over the microphone, we would like to thank the presenting sponsor, Toby Devin Lewis, and the premier sponsor, Oolite Arts, and others who have, are making this event possible, including the National Council, sponsors, corporate and media partners, and all of you who so generously support the mission of Anderson Ranch. And now, Please help us welcome Nick Cave and Helen Molesworth. Welcome. Welcome, Nick. Hi. We're so How happy you? you're here. Me too. Yeah? Yeah. You all ready? I'm ready. <laughs> it's not easy being honored, you know. I mean that seriously. Um, but we are so happy to honor you. Um, you are, as you can tell from Sharon and John's beautiful introduction, you are beloved. You are loved. So, and you're loved because you've made this incredible body of work that has allowed so many people to rethink so many things, whether it's the division of art and craft or the way we keep... Um, I'm getting some slides up. <laughs> some of you understand how funny this picture is. This is a picture of Nick Cave and 
Nick Cave. Um, the white gentleman with the brown hair is the rock musician Nick Cave of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. And so for people of my generation in particular, when we first started to hear like, have you seen these sculptures by Nick Cave? People were like, no shit, Nick Cave's making sculpture? That's amazing. <laughs> And so when I was doing the research and getting ready to interview Nick, I found this photograph and I was like, I have to. <laughs> so anyway, for those of you who are here for the Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds presentation. Stay. Stay. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to rock your world. <laughs> um, but your work has given so many of us an opportunity to, to think outside of old saw horses like art and craft, or even sculpture and performance, you know, fashion and art. You've just, it was like you just decided those categories weren't interesting enough on their own. And so it, I know for me and a lot of my friends, it was a way to just put it down. Like we didn't even have to go there anymore. We could just start with you and have totally different kinds of conversation. And so I think that the work has had you know, part of the reception it's had is it's just been so, um, in addition to being gorgeous <coughs> and mind-blowing at the level of how it's physically made um, and then what it looks like and then what it does, it's just allowed so many of us to think differently. And for that, I'm really eternally grateful to you. So, so the way these goes is I've, um, I have my cheat sheet. I have... Four questions plus a bonus question, and Nick doesn't know what they are. So that's the um, inherent tension of this event. All right, so you ready? Ready. Okay. All the questions are about you, so you're good. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. You're going to know all the answers. <laughs> or, or if you don't, then it's just clearly not a good question. <laughs> all right. Um, one of the things you've talked about a lot is that the sound suits started um, in the wake of the Rodney King event, right? The videotaping of a group of white police officers very violently and deliberately beating a black motorist and then the acquittal of those white police officers and the subsequent um, rebellion and social mayhem that took place in Los Angeles. Um, and you talk about sitting on a bench and seeing a twig and seeing it as discarded and wanting to sort of reclaim this discarded thing. Um, and you talked about it as a strategy about wanting to be, make something visible that had been discarded. And of course that's 1992, which is also the height of the plague years of the AIDS crisis, right? And I'm sure that parts of your life were dramatically affected by that as well. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is the sound suits on the one hand cover us, cover the person who's in them, make them not legible in terms of the color of their skin, the presentation of their sexuality, their gender, um, their class, but they also make the person wildly visible, totally the center of attention, completely at the in the spotlight. And I wondered if you could just talk to us a little bit about the difference between wanting to be hidden and the, wanting the protection of being hidden and wanting the protection of being visible, of being seen. And if you could just talk through that with us a little bit. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, hi everyone, by the way. <laughs> uh, I think the hiding uh, is really sort of me, sort of, you know, what what do I do in terms of to 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 sort of protect my sort of spirit, my sort of being, you know, what are the mechanisms that I sort of put in place uh, in order for me to navigate through this very complex sort of world, uh, and so for me, it's. Uh, It's many different things mm -hmm. uh, because I think, you know, as an artist, as, uh, as myself, you know, there's many ways in which I have to sort of 
function in the world. Um, uh, and so being able to understand what those, uh, what that looks like in terms of its uh, potential, the, the platform is something that I've always sort of been sort of interested in and mm -hmm. curious about. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, the other side of it being sort of uh, something that's fearless, something that is other, something that is sort of larger than life is the sort of other sort of part of my sort of existence. You know, in order for me to sort of do what I need to do, uh, I have to be fearless. Mm -hmm. I have to be to dive into the abyss with uh, without any hesitation. So it really sort of is this sort of thing that I've sort of come to understand that in order for me to sort of work the way that I work, I have to know where the trust is. Mm -hmm. You know, I trust myself enough to know that I can sort of fall into that sort of space that is unfamiliar uh, and still be grounded mm -hmm. and yet curious about that opportunity and what, may it, what it may present. Can I ask you another little question about mm -hmm. trust as a follow-up? Last night, and I strongly encourage all of you, um, when you um, have a minute out of your extremely rigorous social engagements here in Aspen, <laughs> you could go on this, there's this thing called the internet, and um, you can go on it and watch this incredible hour-long uh, documentary about a project that Bob and Nick just did in Shreveport, Louisiana called As Is. And in that, I saw for the first time, I had never seen it before, people putting on the sound suits. I saw this, there's a, a kind of armature that goes on you, and it's like a lot of layering of the components. And I actually had a moment where I was watching it, and I thought, gosh, you'd have to trust somebody a lot to put that much stuff on you. Like, and I wondered if, you know, you just... You could talk a little bit about like what does it feel to be inside one of the suits and to and to be prepared by other people and to be dressed by other people in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think that that you know it is a lot of preparation. Mm -hmm. It's not as easy as you think. Um, and so, what I tend to do is you, when I'm sort of doing uh, a residency or if I'm doing these projects where it involves. Uh, movers, uh, performers, you know, there's part of this sort of exercise process that we go through. I really don't allow you to even put it on at the beginning. It's really just sort of, uh, you know, it's there and you're here and I just want you to sort of talk me through what you're looking at. Mm. And just what does that mean? What does this object look like to you and based on what you see? And then I want you to talk to me about transformation mm -hmm. and surrendering and becoming something other. Because all of this stuff is going to happen in the process of, of this sort of exchange. Right. Uh, and so then, you know, I may have you put it on, but I have you sit still. Mm-hmm. And sitting still really is everything. Because sitting still means that you have to somehow find your internal center mm -hmm. and understand what is going on in, in the midst of that moment. So all of a sudden, you know, you, your identity is no longer revealed. What does that mean? And so um, is the surrender to the stillness, is the stillness the beginning of the transformation? Yeah, the stillness is really the beginning of the transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I may have you stand, and then it's about weight, and it's about restrictions and boundaries, and, you know, how do you sort of deal with that? How do you sort of fold movement into these limitations? Right. So it's really working with people, you know, from a theater uh, dance background that understands their body. Mm -hmm. It's really about understanding your body. And also, you know, again, able to sort of transition. 
Mm-hmm. And so then I will have you start to move, and then we start to build and understand the principles of, of, of the object. Um, and how do you become something other? Because you can move in it, and I could not be convinced. Oh. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of work, mm-hmm. you know, psychologically as well as physically, but it's really quite extraordinary it's, at the same time. It seems like it. It seems like it. All right. Here's my next question. <laughs> when I think about your work, I think about how you've blurred all these categories. And so I was trying to think about if I were a good old-fashioned art historian and I had to really talk about your method. What is the form that you are using? What is your method? And I realized I kept coming back to sewing. That if I had to describe you in a single word as a maker, I would say that sewing seems to be at the, just the core of your practice. Even when you're beating, you are a man with a needle and a thread in your hand. And I wanted to talk to you about the different ways we think about sewing. Because on the one hand, sewing makes these magical creations. You literally, like all art, you take nothing and you make creation, you make magic. And on the other hand, sewing is repairing. It's mending and darning and fixing and, you know, has all kinds of mem- all kinds of metaphors for, you know, a family is sewn together. How do we sew us back together? We've been rendered asunder. How do we weave the fabric back together, right? We have all those metaphors. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about sewing in your work and what it means for you. Sewing in my work. Um... I don't know if I think about sewing in my work, uh, but I can talk about it in terms of, I think it takes many different forms. Mm-hmm. So I don't think sewing is necessarily in, always in the literal sense, mm-hmm. but sewing for me could be, you know, jumping on a plane and flying to Washington State with Bob. Uh, and we'll rent a cargo v- a van, and then we'll shop all the way back at the antique malls and, and, and the flea market. Okay, wait, hold on a second. Does everybody know that this is what they do? They fly to one end of the great country. <laughs> they fly from sea to signing, sh- you know, from the lake. They go all the way to the ocean, and then they rent a truck, and they just drive and shop. <laughs> and they fill a truck with stuff, and they bring it to Chicago. That's what these guys do. I love this. <laughs> And but so, now we got to go back and we're going to talk about how that's sewing. And so in that, pro- <laughs> in that process, you know, I'm sort of, what I'm finding myself doing right now is that I'm building work in the moment. Right. Like it's fascinating, you know. We found this, Bob found this uh, dog once, this ceramic sort of dog. Um, and it was a Doberman, maybe about this big s- seated Doberman, do you have it right there? I got you. (laughs) So he found this dog and said, you know, you got to come and look at this dog. It's amazing. And I was like, why? Because I was not really in that sort of mindset. But, you know, in in the traveling and in the sort of discovery, you know, I have to remain very open. Mm-hmm. to new ways of thinking and making. And so, so I went and looked at it, and I really uh, wasn't that interested right away. And so I just went on and kept looking at other things. And he was like, you've got to get this dog. You've just got to get this dog. <laughs> and so then I went back and looked at it, and I thought, okay, I, I see it. It's interesting. It had this really sort of early sort of Americana sort of look to it, mm-hmm. the way it was painted. And so then I say to him, I need to find a ghost settee for the doll. Obviously. I mean, in just in that second, it was like, he has to be, you know, reclining on a ghost settee. And he's like, okay. <laughs> and let me tell you, by the end of that day, we found it. But 
this interesting thing is, so we found the gold to tea. So we're standing there talking. The salesperson's standing there with us. And I said, can we bring in our dog? <laughs> so they're like, these two. Right. Because where are you now? What state are you in? I'm not sure. Indiana. Indiana. Mm -hmm. And so they... A lot of Hoosiers okay. putting the dogs on the gold Bring in your dog. Mm -hmm. And so Bob goes and gets the dog. And so it's this ceramic dog. So they really are like these two. <laughs> and so then we set it on the uh, settee and it all made sense. It all came together. So for me, that is like sewing. Right. It's sort of like I'm assembling and putting things together as right. I'm discovering. And, and so it's really about sort of through doing that over so many years, I sort of just know the rhythm. I right. know the intuitiveness of what makes sense, what sort of belongs. Uh, and I'm building a work in the moment. Mm -hmm. So to me, that is the same as if I am sort of at the machine constructing. Right. And what about sewing and repair? Because I'm thinking about the way your work is moving out now into, you know, issues of, of um, sort of social justice, engaging people who aren't artists, getting them to make things themselves, using art as a way to get people to talk to one another, to connect with themselves. Is there a quality well, of I repair think, there? Yeah, I mean, I think even when collecting, it's like, you know, most of the, the pieces that are sort of built uh, within the work are sort of found, mm -hmm. recycled materials. So I'm always sort of negotiating uh, their roles in which they play within this sort of new way of thinking about what they once were. But, you know, repair, I think it's really sort of comes into uh, me sort of thinking more about civic and civic responsibility and, and what does that mean to me as a visual artist? Uh, you know, what does it mean when I'm working uh, within, an, within an institution? Uh, I'm more interested in, like, who comes through the institution. Mm -hmm. You know, what, is the, what does the diversity look like? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't look like I want it to look, then I sort of think, okay, what is my responsibility in sort of changing that? Right. And so that's when, you know, this sort of extensive outreach comes into play. It's really sort of uh, just sort of, uh, you know, you know, the work is, on one part, is sort of very tough and difficult, but at the same time, there's, it's about optimism. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think for me, I'm fortunate enough to sort of have a platform where I can uh, get out of my w way and sort of really work in this sort of amazing way where, you know, we'll bring, we bring projects to a city and then hire the city to build them. Right. So... You know, I have no idea who I'm going to be working with. But I'm very intrigued by, you know, pulling up my sleeves and getting into the trenches and discovering all this amazing talent. And, you know, just giving uh, voice to others and mm. letting others know that they're being heard and mm. creating these amazing sort of opportunities and, and projects that... You know, at the end, the audience sees something completely different than what we've been doing for a week or two right. in the process. And just the revelations and the testimonies that come through that is, you know, why I do what I do. Right. That's actually a really good segue into our, um, my next question. I'm going to get you guys some other pictures. There you go. I think of you as a consummate maker. I know when I look at your work and when I have heard other interviews with you and when I've talked to you, like I know in my belly, like you are an artist, capital A, couldn't have been anything different, which is another way of me saying, I know you would have made this stuff if nobody was looking. Oh yeah. Right, like 
you know, and that's a great moment in a studio crit where you say to the, you, the young artist, you're like, you gotta make work as if no one's ever gonna see it, right? But the reality is, is we have seen your work and your work has captured um, the imagination of so many people and, you know, produces a room like this of people very eager um, to be near you, to see you, to hear you, to, to listen to you. And I was curious if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about what does the attention, the fame, the light, the pressure, how does that or does it change what, what you do, how you think about what you do, how you carry yourself? I mean, it's a, been a huge transformation, I would assume. Uh, uh, not really. Not really. How so? Uh, uh, because I'm not in it for that. Mm -hmm. I'm not in it for the fame. I'm not in it for uh, the recognition. You know, I'm a messenger. So once I realized I was a messenger, I sort of was... May I interrupt you for a second? What do you mean you're a messenger? What does that mean? Uh, that I, that, you know, my purpose mm -hmm. here is not, uh, you know, you know, being an artist, uh, I don't know what that, that means so many things to so many different people. Right. Uh, and a messenger for me is that, you know, I'm delivering these sort of deeds and then I move on to my next assignment. So it really is about delivering something. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, without any sort of obligation to uh, its impact. It's just that I've been the one chosen to, 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 to sort of to do that. And so that has liberated me from all of that sort of weight of mm. what's it like to be an artist or what is an artist. So I don't think about it. I don't think about, so when I'm in the studio, I'm just making purely based on what is going on currently in the world mm -hmm. or it may be personal, but it, I'm, I'm just free. I can just sort of make in this sort of way where I'm not bound or, or limited by what that expression looks like or what that right. means. It's really about these sort of, fantastical sort of ideas that are in my head that are bigger than I can possibly imagine and to be able to bring those to fruition is sort of everything. Can we talk about I the mean. magical big ideas in your head? So, <laughs> <laughs> now that I have you here, um, do you see them in your head before they exist? Are they evolving in process? Is it a mixture between the two? Like, um, how, how much of it, I mean, do you ever wake up and think like, I got it, and then you go and make that thing? Or is there more contingency? I'm just curious you know, about your process. I may wake up and think, I got it, and I will write it down. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, I have a list of projects that are these sort of big projects. And, you know, they come into the world when they can. Uh, so it's really sort of working with organizations that can sort of make them happen. Right. So when that opportunity comes about, then I'm sort of like, oh, let's do that. Right. And so, but what I, I already know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. So you do have a picture in your mind. Oh, I have a picture. Right. And right now in, in my sort of career, I'm in a point where, you know, if it can't be realized, I will pull away from the project. Right. Because right now I need to also, you know, I think as artists, we sort of move through a period in our sort of uh, development where we make sacrifices and we pull back and we, you know, we, we but you reach a point where you have to, realize it fully in order for you to know what's next. Mm. Because there are answers I need, questions I need answered through this experience, through this development, through this project that can sort of allow me to sort of 
move and proceed forward. Right. So I, when, you know, when I'm working with organiz organizations that have the budget. Right. It comes down to budget. Uh, uh, I am, and when they say, we want you to dream whatever you imagine. Mm -hmm. And I say, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like, I take that very seriously. Right. And so uh, when they say yes, then we're on. Right. All on. And so, but the amazing thing is that it's just an idea at that moment. And so the most beautiful thing is that, you know, in that process, I'm sort of moving through this process with a group of amazing people that are there to help build right. the, the idea. And so... I think that's the most exciting thing is that, you know, I'm not doing it all alone. When did you have a sense that you were a messenger, that, that you were able to put your <laughs> ego to one side because you had something else, some other kind of work that you needed to do? I, well, I think it was probably, uh, probably, uh, Oh, six, maybe? Oh, six. Seven? Mm hmm What do you think happened that, that created that change in you? Uh, you know, I just woke up one morning and something said, now or never. And so for me, it was like, it's not that I wasn't doing my work, but I knew that I had to let everyone else go. You know, it's like, you know, you sort of move through the world with your friends that are also artists, and, you know, you sort of, sort of, we all sort of move together. Mm -hmm. But at some point, somewhere within that, you have to sort of separate yourself and, mm. and sort of, and you may find that it's a lonely journey. Mm. And so, uh, you know, just sort of coming to terms with with that first and, and understanding that, you know, that the work that I'm interested in doing really has nothing to do with me. It's really about the world outside of of my studio and and you know, that's what that's what matters to me. It's not the exhibitions, it's not it's really the sort of the outreach. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it comes back down to that's what matters to me is the impact mm -hmm. that I can make. And so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there you have it. That, that, you're just segueing into my next question so beautifully. I, it's almost like we planned it. So my next question was to ask you, um, about service, uh, which is, I think, a, a word that a lot of us are thinking about these days and passing around with each other, about what it might mean to think about what we do when we're doing work in culture, um, to think about it as being in service, that we are, in fact, in service to a public, to democracy, to big ideas, to truth, to justice, to beauty. These are huge ideas that have carried the human race and, and that what we might be doing might not be about personal ambition or personal gain and satisfaction, that we might actually be participating in some kind of service. And when you think like that, I think the two easiest poles that we have for thinking about service is, you know, whatever kind of faith tradition you grew up in, you know, because all, all of our faith traditions have some quality of service implied, or civic life, governmental <coughs> life, public life, that also has this quality of service. And I wonder if you could just talk about this, your work and how you're thinking about your work in those, in those terms, both in terms of faith and in terms of citizenship. Uh, in, in terms of faith, uh, I believe in something. I'm not sure what that is. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I don't think that that matters. It's mm -hmm. bigger than me. Yeah. Um, 
but I think it comes, I think it's all about sort of, I think purpose is service. It's like, you know, we're all sort of, we're here to, for some reason. And so, you know, to be able to sort of, you know, what I, what I tend to do is that, you know, every day I sit quiet in silence for probably an hour every mm. day. Um, Just in quiet or in meditation? Yeah. or Well, it's meditation. Meditation? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, can you imagine if we all did that every day? Oh, everything would be better. What a different sort of world we would sort of be living in. Uh, and I think that... Uh, I think that's where it all sort of comes clear because I think, you know, that's when you find that you come close to your truth is when you remove all the noise mm -hmm. and you find that you are, you know, what is this? And, and um, service is really sort of... Um, me connecting to purpose, which is me sort of, you know, you know, how can I serve the community at large using art as a vehicle for change? And so that's how I sort of look at it. And so, you know, art allows me this amazing sort of opportunity to bring, uh, to engage myself into sort of uh, communities that are Un, underserved and right. communities that are less fortunate and uh, to sort of bring these sort of cultural sort of creative ideas there and, and, and to make something fantastic. And what do you think it is about this crazy thing called art that most of us can't even put our finger on but we know it when we see it but we have trouble defining it all the time. What is it about this engine that allows it to like create that kind of change that you're interested in where does it get all its power from uh, you know I think it's uh, I think it's you know the messengers I think it's these the individuals that you know step outside of themselves and and uh, find a greater meaning and why they're here, uh, and uh, being proactive and, and sort of doing what it takes to um, to sort of corral, to get uh, the community sort of on board, to get the world on board. Um, you know, I'm thinking like, I've got a lot to do within between now and 2020. Mm -hmm. I bet you feel busy. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, Bobby, you ready? <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's really sort of, you know, right now we just need, um, you know, I think about like, you know, what are the mechanisms? What can we sort of do to uh, bring us together? I know you've been thinking about optimism. Uh, is this the place where, is optimism the mechanism? I think that's the engine. That's the engine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How are you stoking <coughs> the engine of your optimism? By throwing myself out into the world. Really? Yeah. Because... That's slightly counterintuitive. The world can be a cruel and oh, it's cruel. horrible I didn't place. Say it was, <laughs> well, yes, but uh, at the same time, it can be balanced with wonder and right and excitement and joy. And right now, going forward, all of my work is going to be about happiness. So, mm -hmm. I love that so much. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Because I do think, I think if we could tap into it, the incredible joy and wonder and that produces happiness, that we might be able to figure out how to talk to each other again, right? 
You are so angry right now. Anger is not a good listener. But happiness might be a good listener. Well, I think happiness allows us to sort of come into a space where that's something that we can all connect and identify with mm -hmm. in spite of our differences. And so it's really about the sort of, you know, how do you sort of, how do you make that uh, space in order for, uh, you know, the, the variables in terms of who we are to exist within that and to find this sort of amazing sort of common ground. Right. You ready for my bonus question? <laughs> sure. <laughs> bonus question. This is a bonus question. <laughs> um, I was extremely fortunate and I had a great grandmother I mean, I really had a wonderful, wonderful grandmother in my life. And so whenever I read about people and they mention their grandmother, I want to talk to them about their grandmother. And I know that you have mentioned your grandmother a couple of times in interviews, and I believe you had two grandmothers. And I, I mean, I only ever knew one of mine. And um, I wondered if you could just talk about this incredible body of work that you have, the sense that you're a messenger, bringing something forward, the way you've touched so many people's lives, this sense now that you are having of like, of happiness as this engine, you know. What is the role that your grandmother's played in that for you? You know, I think, you know, my grandparents, uh, you know, it was just really, you know, I have uh, one of six brothers, um, you know, loving family. It was just the unconditional love, mm -hmm. you know. Like when we go home, when I go home for the, whenever I go home, it's like we all hug and kiss each other. We've, we have never, I have never been in a situation where there was, tension or disruption ever around the holidays ever. I don't even know what that, when people talk about that, I'm like, really? Wow. So I've never had that. I think it was because it was all sort of left at the front door. Mm. So it was a really kind of this amazing sort of uh, uh, sort of upbringing that was all about sort of embracing our sort of differences and supporting one another. And, you know, my grandparents were amazing. My parents were amazing in terms of, you know, they had no idea what this all meant, but they recognized that it was something. Mm. And so, you know, I think, you know, I think parents, you know, it's for me, it's like my mother sort of conditioned me and then handed me off to school. And so there was someone in school, an art teacher, that said, you know, you should really look at art as a perhaps a, a, a direction to sort of to move toward. And so I was always, I felt, I feel that I was, have always been groomed. Mm. to be who I am. I mean, you know, at the age of 13, my mother brought, bought my, me my first pair of platform shoes. I mean, like, <laughs> do you understand, like, how, what a big deal that was for me? Like, I, I do, and my mom, I'm just like, Pew! And they were two-toned, so I Of course. Like, wow! <laughs> but it's that kind of thing where it was like, you know, I was like, at that moment, she didn't have to say anything because I was, you know, given the space to be liberated in that, in that moment. So right. it's these sort of things. And, you know, my grandmother on my mother's side saying to me that, you know, touching me on my forehead when I was very young in the car going to the grocery store, and she said, you have Papa's soul, which is my great-great-grandfather. And so for me, when she did that, I just felt like I was coded with mm. something. Mm. And so that's beautiful. It has given me the tough skin that I've needed to pursue. 
You make it all forward. look so easy, Nick. It's not easy. I know it isn't. <laughs> I know it isn't, but part of your generosity, and I think part of the generosity of the work is that you make it look like it could be easy. It's like a little, like a light, like a trick to get you to come in. It's really extraordinary, you Thanks. know, that the work offers so much room for the viewer to have her thoughts, to have her fantasies, to have her imagination run wild. Um, like some <laughs> little boy getting a pair of platform shoes somewhere around 13. It's, it's got that kind of moment. I mean, it's a similar gesture. You know, you, you look at the sound suit and you just think like, what? <laughs> so it's thank you so much for sharing that quality of you with us. It's really, really moving. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> we have we have a few minutes. I think we could probably take two or three questions if there are some. I know I can't be the only person with a list of questions. So here in the front, if you'll just wait for the microphone, please. Hi, Nick. Thanks. Hi. Um, What's I your name? Barbara Gamson. Hey, Barbara. And I saw you in Toronto with the Haymans. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I want to know how you came to the Hustle Coats. The Hustle Coats. Um, you know, I think... Uh, he, Could you tell us what a Hustle Coat is first, please? Well, a Hustle Coat is a sculpture, uh, but it comes out of... You know, I think as a kid, you know, my parents would sort of... They would come to Chicago occasionally, and we would come with them, and... You know, on the street, there was always these men that would have on these trench coats and open them up, and there would be all this gold jewelry inside. And so I was, as a kid, was just sort of fascinated by it all, just like, what? And so, you know, it really comes from that sort of, uh, sort of being in the world and sort of having that sort of experience. But at the same time, it's really looking at... Um, class and clout and uh, sort of creating this, you know, I think the moment that I sort of sort of shifted from sound suits into this other body of work, I was sort of thinking about what does that mean? How do I sort of move from one body, how do I sort of move from what I've known for into this other way of thinking? And so I sort of, it, you know, I thought about it for quite some time, and so what it what I came to was really sort of the essence. You know, how do I transfer the essence over into this uh, other ways of working? And so, you know, it, it's really sort of comes out of that. You know, it's 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 sort of you know how can I sort of make something, and when I and and to look at it and for it to say Nick Cave, it has to it has to do that, and so. That's great. I don't really need a mic. You know that. Actually. You do need a mic, Anne. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Nick, when I was... Anne, hi. Hi, sweetheart. Uh, <laughs> so when I was at the studio about a month ago in Chicago, yes. very privileged, thank you, um, we talked about joy. We talked about the antidote to the pain that so, you know, our society is in, the divisions that our society um, are, are in today, um, that joy was an antidote. And so I thought it would be nice if you talked about your latest project that's going to open August 8th in Boston and how okay. one way in which you're ter interpreting joy. Okay, and so, you know, I've been thinking about, like, joy and happiness, which, what comes first. And I think that joy comes first. And joy for me is the process. It's sort of me in the studio making what I'm making, and happiness comes from the results oh, of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so right now, my first sort of project that's about happiness opens August 8th in Boston at the Cyclorama. Um, and what I decided to do was to collect all of the holiday inflatables, all of them, and cut them up and sew them back together, making these enormous inflatables. 
They're about the size of this room. And so there's going to be five of them that will be, uh, I think, three that are hovering above our heads and then two that are sitting on the uh, floor. And they will be on timers, so they will deflate and inflate. Uh, but, you know, we go into the holidays with great intentions. And for the most part, it becomes sort of like a disaster. I really want to... Except apparently at your house. <laughs> I'm coming to your house for the next Christmas I'm going to. You know, it was amazing making them. Mm -hmm. I made them myself mm -hmm. because in terms of constructing them, it was so complicated. And I really could not sort of tell my assistants how to do it. Right. So I just did it. Um, but I'm telling you, we're talking t around the clock for what? Four oh, months. I'm sure. Just sewing. But yeah. You know, the end result is magical. Oh, I can't wait. So, I can't wait. So that's going to open up August 8th, and so I'm excited to sort of see it. I mean, and I think for me, it's like, you know, I'm making this work in the studio, but to put it in context, it's, you know, I don't have the space large enough that can even hold one of the inflatables. So you haven't seen so them So I have yet. not seen them. That Yet. is going to be so much fun. I've seen them, part of them, and so. Is this the first time you're going to do something at that scale that you haven't seen before? Oh, no. Oh, okay. No. So you're an old hand this at that. Is, yeah. All right. Because that would make some girls nervous, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly not you. All right, we've got one, time for one more question. Does anyone want to round us out here? Sam. Sam. Sam, you know, I know Sam, Me and Sam went to undergrad together. So, so we're Sam. like okay. buddies. Um, I, don't, I, I hope this doesn't um, ruin the, the secret about this. but um, <laughs> You want to whisper it to me? <laughs> so n the last time Nick and I hung out in Chicago was just a couple of years ago. <clears throat> we were driving around. And he told me this thing that really kind of like blew me away in a way. You remember you, you told me about <laughs> taking money, putting it in an envelope, and driving around Chicago and handing it to people who needed it? Mm -hmm. That was amazing. So when Helen talked about service, I think about how you have a large service, but then you have a direct service to individuals that you see at bus stops and around an area and you just give them money, don't say anything, and you drive away. So that <laughs> has stayed with me and I want to thank you for that. Sure. Because there's there's the notion of wanting to do something and then there's doing something. Mm -hmm. Right? So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> That's a beautiful place to stop. I want to thank you for being a great audience, and I also want to encourage all of you to come and take a class. Because if you really want to get the magic of art, come and take a class. Nick, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.